morning, all in the house, and all who are following the service in, from the home. Uh, welcome to the service. Shall we start this service with a prayer? Lord, you call us to worship together as a body of believers, Lord. And we are here today to honor that call of yours, and we are privileged and we are blessed to be able to hear your call and to be part of all that you want us to do when we come together. May our hearts be lifted up in worship and our worship may be acceptable to you. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Mm, good to see all of you here. And those that I cannot see, but who are seeing me, good morning as well. Uh, today, I start on the new series called On the Book of Proverbs. What I'm going to read here from verses 1 to 7 is actually, in your Bible, the introduction to the book of the whole of Proverbs. So today we're just going to look at the introduction, and then we will follow on then as we go on in the series. So Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 to 7 goes like this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. So these verses will give you an idea what he's leading you into. Eh? So uh, that is why what an introduction is, is to warn you ahead what is going to come. So can you imagine if we go through into this book, it will help us to know wisdom and instruction and understand words of insight. To receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice and equity. Equity is to be fair. To give prudence to the simple knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs belong to a group of five books. One of the five books of the Old Testament, they call the wisdom book or book of, books of wisdom. Uh, there are five, but actually, if you add in what they call the Apocrypha, you find another two more. But because we are Protestants, we don't generally regard the Apocrypha as part of our Bible. But uh, if you are among some traditional denominational circles, they will say, yes, you can read the Apocrypha for... Learn, uh, for learning, but not for instruction, uh, not for doctrine, uh, for reading, to get value from it, but not for doctrine. You cannot draw doctrine from the, those sets of books. So, confining to the Protest Protestant set of books that we accept as part of the Bible, we have five books of wisdom, and they are Proverbs. Look, this is not in the order found in your Bible, because... I have chosen the order based upon the amount of wisdom saying they have. Proverbs has the highest amount of wisdom saying. Second comes Ecclesiastes. Third comes Job. And fourth comes Psalms. For example, Psalm 49 is a wisdom saying. You will find a lot of Proverbs like saying in the book of, uh, in the Psalm 49. And then the least of all is the Song of Songs. So these are the books of wisdom. I will first generally refer to them as a collection of books, but I will zero in on the book of Proverbs as our focus of study today. The book of Proverbs, or the books of wisdom, has one, is finding the answers to the question, how do I live successfully? So it has a very practical slant to it. Sometimes we don't see the practicality of it, but if we take a little bit time of time, to think about it, we can see how practical these books are. The book of Proverbs deals with how to live in this world. It never asks the question why, because why doesn't lead you to any kind of action. It only asks how. For example, it does not ask, why are we suffering? It asks, how do I suffer well? Can you imagine that kind of mentality? So when you read Job again as the book of suffering, they are not trying to answer the question, why would a good man suffer? He is more attempting to try to give an answer, 
a question to the answer to the question how in the midst of all these circumstances how do we suffer correctly because suffering you can suffer in the wrong way or suffering you can suffer in the right way no why do i why do why is there evil but the question they are trying to answer is how do i avoid evil then there's no such thing as why they need to have a god they assume there's a god in the beginning god so they all assume there is a god so they are not asking a question why do we need a god but they are asking a question how do i walk rightly with this god so you get this kind of approach in issues of life and if you stop asking the why and ask asking the how the book will become a very practical book and i want to start off by saying i recognize that the book of proverbs is to give you practical wisdom that is standard in many commentaries and you can say that it is a book just to make uh, to help us find a practical way uh, of living our life and that is accepted and i am telling you there is a place to treat the books of wisdom and particularly the book of proverbs in that way so how do i live a successful life you ask the how 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 and all the answers collected you will get a very practical book it's not a theological book it is a practical book but as you can see it has many layers as well we we'll go on so I want to ask you uh or rather the three headings for today based on the first seven verses of the book of proverbs why do we study proverbs what what is proverbs trying to achieve uh, or what is tr- proverbs trying to instill in us when we study proverbs and this book the proverbs is for who you may think it is for all of uh, yes it's for all but you'd be surprised that he also include a section of people you never expect to be there and then how do we start right so i hope that by the time we get through you have some idea how you're going to approach the book of proverbs so on the surface the book of proverbs look like a book of unconnected sayings it's just a collection of random sayings but i hope to show you that the book of proverbs is controlled by only one goal and that it has an aim it has a mind it has a method and it should be read with that aim in mind as we can see so let me walk through this with you you got to follow me as best as you can uh, god is love right so he gave two great commandments right thou shall love the lord thy god with all your heart with all thy soul with all thy strength with all thy might and then to love your neighbor as yourself jesus himself say all the laws that means all the laws from the 10 commandments on this all the laws that are coming out from these two Uh, 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 from the 10 commandments all depend on these two great commandments so i'm working backwards god is a god of love and from his love he set two commandments love god with all your heart and then love your neighbor fair you can follow then from that two great commandments to make it more practical you have the 10 commandments do you follow that the 10 commandments come out from these two great commandments these two great commandments come from the god of love so you see the connection there so from this idea we see that to love god there has to be a practical way how to go about it so to love god he gave us four commandments i prefer the word words huh? in original hebrew it meant words so the four okay we stick to commandments but it, it was meant more not like a law like statute like kind of uh, words it has a little bit softer than laws okay you can say they are like uh, principles on how you can be uh, going about to love god so the first four commandments show us how we love our god how love god exclusively thou shall not have any other gods so that's a first commandment second commandment no images of god fair huh? so the third commandment don't don't take his name in vain don't cheapen the name of god so that's what he's trying to tell us how we love our god then keep the sabbath holy that is one form you love your lord love the lord with all your heart 
that way. So this first four help a person reading it know how to love his God. He just follow this. Then to love our neighbour, he gives six commandments. The next six commandments show us how to love our neighbours. The fifth commandment say, by the way, our father and mother are our first neighbours. No? So honour your father and honour your mother. Then come the sixth commandment, don't murder. Seventh commandment, don't commit adultery. Don't steal, don't lie, do not covet. So these are ways you show you love your neighbour. It's explicating, it's expanding, it's uh, unpacking what it means to love your neighbour. Don't murder, don't commit adultery. That means, you know, take somebody's wife. Don't steal, don't lie, don't covet. Clear? But that is not enough. You will find that in the book of Proverbs, many of his Proverbs hark back to the part on loving your neighbour. So as you can see on the screen there, the, the love your neighbour commandments, from the fifth commandment to the tenth commandment, Proverbs will give proverbial sayings that hark back or link back to one of the commandments. They are not enough. You have 350 over Proverbs and these are just a few. But it gives you a clue that the writer or the compiler of Proverbs had in mind that the, of the Ten Commandments, when he's compiling all these various sayings, all these Proverbs, all these riddles, all these wise sayings found in the book of Proverbs. So there is, I, trying, I hope I can help you to see that there is something that is anchoring the book of Proverbs. It's not so random like you think because at the bedrock of Proverbs is the commandments of God. Underneath the Ten Commandments there are the two commandments of God. Underneath the two commandments is the love of God Himself. So you see that it is not just so disconnected, but there's a train there. And if you can see the train, you can see the link, I've done my job. Many Proverbs may not appear to have a strong link, huh? true, but we will see that overall, um, you will see this thing coming out. And in fact, up to the Ten Commandments, there is a lot of room for innovation because life is not so rigid, life is not so fixed, life is a lot more fleet more than we all think. We have all our plans, but things can go one way and that way. And so the Ten Commandments have the room for you to innovate correctly. That's why it takes wise people to take the old rigid, what look like rigid commandments and be able to apply it in the right way. Because we can say that the Ten Commandments, as I say, has room for innovation. So how did the Pharisees do it? He came up with 356 extra sayings or rules or wisdom or to help you carry out the Ten Commandments. Because by itself, how do you apply? How, how, how? How do you live this life? So he came up. So we all, being saved by grace, know that we are not saved by law. Sometimes we look down or not look down, uh, we kind of say, uh, like we are, why did the Pharisees so pharisical come up with 356 extra rules? But you must know where their motivation comes from. Their motivation is coming from the point, if we are leaders, we want to help the congregation to be able to answer the question, how do I obey the Ten Commandments? So you keep the Sabbath holy. They've got to find a way. So they come up with this rule. You, and one of the things is that you cannot walk long. Uh, you cannot walk more than don't know how many miles on the Sabbath day. Anything beyond that mark is called work. So there's such a thing as a Sabbath journey. That means it's the length of time allowed by one of the 365 laws that the Pharisees created. So yeah, people need a fixed way to understand, oh, how do I... Uh, obey God in that way. One after another, from the pots to the utensils to how you even, um, you know, uh, carry out everyday life on Sabbath is what they're trying to do to make all these things of the Ten Commandments 
much more practical and usable for everyone. Rather than having said the Ten Commandments and put them in the bookshelf and forget all about it. No, the Bible wants you to take it down from the bookshelf and make it work everyday life because if you do that, you will be a very wise person according to the Bible. Okay, so let's be clear. I won't go through that, but that's just to give you. But Moses himself did this in, you know, at the end of his life, he, he wrote, well, close to the end of his life before he was taken up, by, uh, I don't know, he was supposed to die or taken up by the Lord. Yeah, that one you have to go and read all over again the Bible and look at it again. But he knows he's coming to the end of his time on earth. So this is his farewell message. The whole book of Deuteronomy is like a farewell message. When you are speaking your farewell message, there are certain things you want to say in the farewell message. Of course, what he did best was to remind the people what he heard from God, the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words found in Exodus. So now he's going to go away. So he rehearsed everything. The part where he went to rehearse the Ten Commandments are found in Deuteronomy 6, 1, right up to chapter 26, verse 19. So that whole section of the book of Deuteronomy is just a rehearsal of how to apply the Ten Commandments again. So for example, the first one, you shall have no other gods besides me, he picked it up in 6, chapter, four, eh, chapter 6, verse 4, right up to 11.32 on how you apply the first commandment. You shall not have any other gods besides me. And it goes on and on and on through. Some of the verses are not related. Yeah, we will see it dangling out, standing out like often in the section there, in the passage. And we wonder, how does that got to do with... Uh, got to do with... Uh, uh, what say, for example, uh, some, some say a commandment like uh, "Thou shalt not steal." Do you know that section on "Do not steal"? "Thou shalt not steal," which is in the next one, the eighth commandment. Between twenty-three to twenty-four, you will hear the divorce laws. Hey, you ask yourself, what has divorce got to do with stealing? We can't see it, right? I'm not smart. I just read only and I'm telling you what I read, okay? So, do not steal. And what's it got to do with divorce? Remember, as the, when the man marries the woman, right? And the man found a fault with the woman. So, it's, the woman is at fault. So, the man, the husband's husband, writes an original, writes a certificate of divorce. Now, in the certificate of divorce, it's not just only to say he is divorced, but what property he, she went out with. Because she is now at fault, there is zero in the divorce certificate. She got nothing. Then she married a second one. Now the Bible says in that particular verse, that man, the, first, the second husband, could have hated her, which makes him at fault. You see, the Bible looks at divorce with fault and no fault one, eh? which our modern day doesn't, or he could have died. Now, in her certificate, all his, because it is his fault, he will have some dowry left. And also all the inheritance rights of this man's property. All that go into the second certificate of divorce. Now, the Bible says, if that first original husband wants to marry her, cannot. Because... That first original husband say, yeah, last time she got no money. Now she got money. I want to marry her again to get all her inheritance rights and all the dowry left by the second husband. So the Bible says, say, no, you cannot do that. That's stealing. That's unfair financial management. In the first place, you never love her. So forget about her money. Now you want her money, you marry her back. Cannot. That's what they say. A stopper. <laughs> so that's what they try, what they are trying. So how is divorce related with money? Yeah, it's all there. 
But we read it as divorce. It doesn't say can divorce, not divorce. It's not talking about divorce. It's talking about money. Because you must not steal. In other words, what he's trying to say is have a fair management principle on some of these things. And you go on and go on. And all until the end of uh, uh, Deuteronomy 25, uh, uh, five, the, the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, come to the tenth commandment there, he repeats. And then in Deuteronomy 6, he picks up on all the a- application of how this do not cover comes about. Okay? I have time only to deal with one. I will deal with one called do not murder. That's the sixth commandment. And you'll find the kind of explanation found in Deuteronomy 19, verse 21 to chapter 22, verse 8. Well, I said, do not murder. But life, yeah, is a very broad thing. It encompasses many things. So Moses break it down. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Moses break it down to all the various situations you will face when you see dead bodies. Okay, there are things as people may have unintentionally murdered somebody. Does he get punished? There's a way to talk about it. There's a way where there's an intentional murder, therefore you treat it differently. For those who, are, who accidentally or unintentionally kill somebody, they are spared because Moses commanded the Levite cities to build a city of refuge. Every tribe would have about three cities of refuge where people who have committed an intentional murder can run to for refuge before all the in-laws come and attack you, all the family get revenge on you. So that's a way of escape. Simple. So it's making it all down to a very practical level. Do not murder. Does not, you will get this question, how do I apply at some situation? It gives you the kind, it won't cope. I won't call it clues, but an idea how you can innovate in the correct way. Not innovate until you tear the rule apart, but innovate in such a way that it still conforms to the original intention of God's mind, and yet at the same time, a liberty to carry out wisely. What about just and unjust killing? Well, very simple. You don't just simply go and attack. In war, it doesn't mean you can kill everybody. First thing you must do, the Israelites are told, you must offer a uh, to have peace offer first. Ask them whether they will accept the peace. If they accept the peace, you cannot kill them. Why? They accepted your peace already. But if they refuse their peace, yes, you can besiege them, attack that city, and you can kill all the men only, but not the women and the children. So there are rules how they can kill people in war. Do not kill, do not murder, are all these practical things. So what happened if one in the village, they find a, a, a dead body. Now you got a corpse on your hand. Somebody killed this man. And we don't know, know whether it's intentional, unintentional, accidental, or self-killing, uh, suicide, or homicide. We don't know. So what are you going to do? There's a murder. And somebody must pay for it. Huh? When there's a dead body, somebody's for it. So they give Moses gives in this Deuteronomy chapter 20, 20 uh, uh, somewhere 20 something. And he tells them what to do. He told them, look, get all the elders come together and offer a high first offering over running water and call the priests from the city of Jerusalem to come. And they are supposed to pray a prayer, prayer like this. They pray towards God and say, our hands did not shed this blood. Nor did our eyes see it shed. Accept atonement, O Lord, for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, and you do not set the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel, so that their blood guilt may be atoned for. You atone it like this. You call on God and say, we didn't see. We We didn't kill this man. We didn't see how this man died. So, atone for us. Protect us, forgive in an indirect way, asking God to cleanse the village free of any guilt by doing these kind of things. They go in that fine detail so that you can be practical. And guess the last one is so interesting. 
When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet, a balcony on your roof. Hey, hey, what, what's got building a, 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 a parapet, a balcony on your roof got to do with killing? Do not murder. You will see. That you may not bring guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall on it. It's so practical. It now is do not murder. By the way, in the original Hebrew, includes death through your negligence, through your carelessness. You got to stop killing by being careless or negligent. That is how you show love for your neighbor. So you see that they all have this thing going on. And Proverbs is like that as well. Proverbs is like the Deuteronomy kind of passages. A lot of things on how you can make the Ten Commandments practical. How we can work it out. So God is love, as I've shown you. He asks us to love God and love neighbor. And it comes out in the Ten Commandments, four to four, loving God, six for loving our neighbor. And Proverbs are just a whole lot of these kind of sayings that can be traced back. Not all are very clear, but if, you, if we have time, if I have time, and more scholars have time, they think, 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 they can somehow trace it back to one of the Ten Commandments, how you can love God better, how you can love your neighbor better. So it is not just something that uh, we will say, you know, just be a clever person. Uh, some people will say, you know, uh, if we all can think, uh, we all can say the same things. Oh, people will say, wise men think alike. They say that. Uh, but I will always add, fools seldom defer. And you see in Proverbs, when I say that, eh, you must read whole of Proverbs together. Because sometimes, when we think alike or say alike, we are very wise. Sometimes when we say alike, we are stupid people. You must balance that. So it has that practicality of taking the whole of the book of uh, Proverbs and work its way out line by line by line by line in order to build a kind of a mindset that will transform the heart. Why do you read Proverbs? It's for this purpose then. Because the book is grounded in the Ten Commandments. And therefore, it is then grounded in the two great commandments. And therefore, grounded in God's love. We study Proverbs to let God's love shape our hearts and our minds and transform our lives. That's why you study Proverbs. You must be able to capture the whole wisdom of the entire Ten Commandments. The underlying that is the God of love Himself that it can transmit that love of God to you in your everyday life and expression. That's what the book of Proverbs for. Now, I got your interest now. So, why study the Proverbs? For whom? Yeah, we will say for you and me. But verse 4 and 5 is very clear. For the simple, for the youth, for the wise, and for one who understands. Simple. Simple is a person who do not want to make decisions. They want to remain an undecided as long as they can. They got no commitments. They are neither left nor right. They are neither black or white. You don't know what they are. And they want to remain that way as long as possible because they want to keep the options open. And some of the op options are not so good, but they also want to keep it open. So these are the simple people. Then, when you come to think about the youth, the youth is someone who is starting out in life with no experience in life. So he is very prone to making a lot of wrong choices. He is almost at the point of crossroads. That's why when you come to Proverbs 8, there are two women calling them. The voice of the woman, wisdom calling, come to my house. And the woman, the woman, the strange woman calling this young man to her house. He said, my banquet is ready, my house is ready. Enticing him if he can. So young people are of that kind of vulnerability because they are at crossroads. They must make decisions. And the book of Proverbs, if we can transmit the wisdom of the book of Proverbs into them, they can make up better decisions for, you, for, for themselves. Huh? Why do wise people need to read the book of wisdom? Ah, 
this is a category of people, a lot of people don't think that they need wisdom. Wise people need wisdom. So are you all very wise? Then he said, increase in wisdom. We are all at an age. Huh? Sometimes any new project come to us, I'm feeling like that now. Because you can't, hey, I'm old, I don't want to try new things. Too tiring. But I, I, if you hit the book of Proverbs, it says when you are wise, which usually is associated with old people. Did you hear that? And because we are at that kind of stage of life, we don't want to do new things. But can I suggest to you, hit the wisdom of Proverbs. It tells you if you're wise, be wiser still. There's no limit to the acquiring a heart of wisdom. You can be wise and wiser and wiser and wiser. Why not take the challenge? Isn't that wonderful that we think, oh, I'm oh, I'm wise. Hey, you have not reached the limits of your wisdom yet. You can be wisdom exponentially if we get hold of the book of Proverbs. That is why I believe in lifelong learning. Don't stop learning. Keep on learning as much as you can in this life. And then one who understands, he gets guidance. And sometimes we all want a prophetic word to guide us, and that's good. But sometimes just being wise, we know what is the next step to take. As I say so many times, huh? you see a piece of waste paper here? You don't have to pray, you don't have to get a prophetic word. Just pick it up, throw it into the waste paper basket. Do you need that? A, a word of the Lord? To know how? I was driving with the late Kupek one in the car, one day traveling on the highway. You know, at that time, they put posters, they put signboards on, I don't know whether you still remember, on the plus highway. Kota Dunder. Have you seen that? Koto, eh, Koto, <laughs> question mark, Dunder. Have you seen it? Yeah, you seen it. <laughs> so we are of the, I, think, I don't think it's that uh, uh, late. Uh, I think it's some years back, not too, not too recent. Okay, he was sitting beside me. He, he said, Koto, Dunder. Uh, yeah, he said, so stupid. Koto, Chuchi. I <laughs> Dunder. <laughs> Wise men speak up the truth, right? I mean, that's sen sensible. And I keep on saying, <laughs> he gets the point. Government would think, koto dunder. But wise people say, koto chuchi. How do we start? Wait, I thought I was going to take very long. <laughs> Thank God. How do we start? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge Fools despise wisdom and instruction. By the way, when you come to read the book of Proverbs, oh, there's a fifth group of people. Right? Just now I listed out to you. Four, simple, youth, the wise, and one who understands. There's a fifth group called the foolish one. The, what they practice folly. That means they are fools. And the whole book of Proverbs mention them, but never, never address them. Do you get the point? The book of Proverbs never call or talk to foolish ones. Why? It say here, they despise wisdom and instruction. What about talk to them? Only mention them only, what kind of people they are, but we'll never talk to them. So, there's a fifth group of people that should really <laughs> look at the book of Proverbs, but they are not called because oh, the woman of wisdom in the book of Proverbs said, well, before I talk to you, what well, I tell you, you don't want one, you refuse one. So, when we come to this and realize that you have to have... How does Proverbs actually motivate us. It show us pain and pleasure, good and evil to motivate us. 
So once you look at it, before you even look at the first part, the second half already can give you a little bit chill effect, isn't it? It's very chilling to read that fools despise wisdom and instruction. Don't you ever be one. And in fact, if you are one, the Bible won't talk to you. The Bible doesn't want to talk to you because what's the point? You're not going to listen. So don't make up your mind. Come out from that category quickly. Say today, I choose wisdom. I choose instruction. And start on the path of being wise. What is the fear of the Lord? Very hard. I've read so many translations on how they translate fear. I really got no single word to tell you. In fact, one particular version of when they come to fear, they translate that as love. But that's a bit stretching the word too much. Lah. So these are some of the words that I have found that are better suited for the word fear. Terror. Oh, you get scared. Does God terrify you? Okay. I mean, our song leader was trying to comfort you a lot just now. Yeah, God comforts us. But in a certain sense, there's a way God terrifies us. He has to because the things, are, the things that are at stake are so high. How can He not terrify us? He has to. All right, give room for that. I'm not saying that, oh, therefore we can terrify each other every day, eh? hide in the dark room and, say, and terrify you. That's not what it means. It does not mean. But the way that the Lord does things, He can, he can put some kind of, that kind of good fear. Right? The fear, that the wrong fear, there's a wrong type of fear that drives us away from God. There's a fear of the Lord that pulls us back to God. That is the best way to define this fear of God. If you have this fear of God, you'll be drawn to God, not run away from God, not terrified by God in that sense. It is also to do with the word awe. There's some amount of wonder about God that is found in this word fear. And lastly, one word that I like very much is the word respect. There's a very high respect for who God is. That's why he writes that first four commandments about himself. And you have to respect God. So when we have this combination, I sometimes think that this fear of God is not a single image or photograph. Rather, it's a video. Because in some instances, when I actually, um, well, when, when I have felt the fear of God, there's a terror there. Then it slowly turns to, oh, it becomes more a sense of, this is God. There's an awe about it. And then at the end of the whole so-called experience, you walk away having a very built-in high respect for God without men teaching you. There's a way we can train people to respect certain things, right? But there's a way that respect gets built into our heart where it becomes more of an instinct of our heart rather than being taught by people. And I'm not saying both. I'm not saying one is better or the other. Both are needed because sometimes we don't feel it so instinctively that we have to train ourselves in order to be able to respect God. So that is the last part of it. He said, how do you have, how do you start to gain knowledge, to gain wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It starts with that. If you do not have that uh, fear, you're not going to go anywhere. Because wisdom is taught to those who have the fear of the Lord. That we are fearful of Him. That we are in awe of Him. We are respectful of Him. Then we come to, how do we then go about it? We start with the fear of God. But fear of God, like I said, has to, in some sense to be imparted to us. And there are two prayers that are found in the book of Psalms that can help us. Come, O children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. These are the words said by the psalmist 
but actually it's spoken by the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can teach you the fear of God. So you can say to God, God, teach me the fear of God. Give me the fear of God. Holy Spirit, impart the fear of God. In the book of Acts, he said, great fear came upon the people. That was the fear of God. And if the Holy Spirit is the one who can impart that fear of God, is the one who invite you. He said, come children, and I will teach you the fear of God. The fear of God can be taught. If you're a willing student, if you're willing to learn, you can gain that fear of God in your life. And secondly, this is a prayer that Moses said to be Moses. He prayed in Psalm 90. Because of all that who God is, the eternity of God, and the creative power of God, the sovereignty of God's power, the God who made heaven and earth, the God who gives us life, the God who remains eternal from generation to generation. Man may come, may come grow up and become old, God remains the same. So this eternal God said something in the heart of Moses that he uttered out this prayer. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. I think that we all can know wisdom more, or rather we be more urgent in trying to gain a heart of wisdom if we know our days are numbered or our days are getting... That will make us more urgent. Who oh, teach us to number our days. Eh? Then, so that we may gain a heart. Why? When you are actually pushed to a point where you see things clearly, eh? people on, when talk about their death or you know, come to the end of their life, all sorts of feelings come to you. But one thing very stuck is from now until that day, right? you want to make the best of the remaining days. Sure, you need that heart of wisdom. And that's what led Moses to pray this prayer, or led the congregation to pray. Oh Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may gain. The gaining right, is incremental. Bit by bit by bit by bit, you gain a heart of wisdom. If someone tell you, I can give you a crash course on how to be wise, don't buy that. Wisdom is never gained through a crash course. Wisdom is never gained in one week even. Wisdom is a lifelong quest. You have to gain it bit by bit, proverb by proverb, saying by saying, riddle by riddle. So that's how you gain that heart of wisdom. When the children of Israel returned from the exile, the Babylonian exile, somewhere about 500 BC thereabouts, I sometimes, uh, I'm aware there are two dates for the return of the children of Israel. So sometimes you can mix up, but I'm just telling you it's about 500 BC. And the priests, the teachers of the nation were faced with one very important issue. The temple has been rebuilt. But the temple is not the temple that they knew about. It does not have the Ark of the Covenant. It does not have the glory of God. And they have seen a great loss. If you have never seen the glory of God, right, you won't mind. But this older generation have seen the glory of God. And to see that glory of God departed, like Ezekiel the prophet mentioned, it's heartbreaking. It's one of those things that put a powerful fear of God in you. So they were motivated by this whole thing. How can we now guide a whole generation of people not to lose the preciousness of the gifts and the graces of God? That was uppermost on their mind. And there was no way they could sort of overnight kind of Put that kind of character into the lives of the people. So at that point, there has already been Proverbs. Solomon wrote more than 3,000 Proverbs. 
All these are lying around. And so those leaders, those priests, those teachers then start the business of compilation. And what they compile is what you have in the book of Proverbs. Yeah, there are Proverbs from Moses' time, from Solomon's time, from the first kings. Some kings said some very beautiful Proverbs, give wise sayings here and there. And they, in one section of your Bible, somewhere 22, or I, I, I didn't remember that part. But they are all straight out from the Egyptian wisdom books as well. The other nations collected their wisdom books much earlier than Israel. They were late comers, but it didn't mean that they don't have those wisdom sayings. It was now begin to be a major task of those priests and leaders and Levites, those who have a responsibility to gather the sayings of God, to start compiling those books here. And they put in around 350 proverbs in there with one aim in mind, that they want to build a group of people who will have that kind of character that will not lose the glory of God. They want to build a nation again. They want to start all over again. They cannot build temples. They cannot build buildings. They have one task to do. Build the minds of the people. Let the minds of the people be soaked in the commandments of God. That will prevent the next disaster. Not only that, that will be able to preserve what God is doing. And it all come down to those ten commandments that you can reduce them and summarize them to two commandments. But if you are Pentecostal, you can reduce that to one. God is love. And if you could carry that whole thing and build it inside the people, then they know there's a sure way that the whole nation will be on the right path sooner or later. The glory of God will reappear again. That was their task. And can we say that that should be everyone's task here? That you build the wisdom of the book of Proverbs inside of you. That your mind is marinated. You ladies who cook, you know how to marinate your meat. Marinate your brains with the word of God. Saturate it. You scientists, physicists know what is saturation, right? Saturate your mind with that kind of thinking. Let Proverbs shape your mind. And then you can transform the heart to be a vessel for that glory. They were smart. That's why it's my, my, my picture is pillars. He said, wisdom has built his, her house and he has seven pillars there. That is what it will be. You build it like it's a house with a proper foundation, which is the fear of God and the wisdom sayings come. So because Proverbs is rather random, subsequently, the rest of this series, I won't be able to stick to one passage. I have to run all over the book of Proverbs and draw out topically for you how we can walk with God, how we can walk with our neighbor, how we handle our money. It's practical, practical, practical all the time. But because when you're dealing with the practical, you, it's on the surface so practical, you lose what is the underneath foundation that holds these practical sayings. It is so easy, and I, that's the last thing I wish you do. Read Proverbs just to get one or two things on the surface. But if you could just let your heart sink down to the very foundations that make up Proverbs, you will become the kind of person who will think God all the time. That's the aim of Proverbs. And that's a challenge before all of us. So we don't read Proverbs. When a man is soaked in the Proverbs of the book of Proverbs, say, let's be practical. And a man who does not know Proverbs and say, let's be practical, 
Same words, but they mean two different things. That's our challenge. That we can say, let's be practical and can know where we come from. There is a rootless kind of practicality that in literature we call it pragmatism, just trying to make things work only. Just being pragmatic. It's a good virtue to be pragmatic. But there's a pragmatism, a practicality that comes and springs from this kind of wisdom. Shall we pray? We thank you, Lord. We ultimately, in our search for wisdom, we will come to that Proverbs 8, where we realize that, proverb, that wisdom is finally a person. And it takes the New Testament to help us understand that wisdom resides in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For by grace, Lord, Christ has become to us wisdom, Lord. We want this kind of wisdom. We see this kind of wisdom explicated inside the book of Proverbs. But we also know that as it leads us these days, it will lead us ultimately to Jesus, our wisdom, Lord. So here, Lord, we ask, can we at this room now, just each one of us at different stages, if we are the young, we know what we are going to pray Make your prayers. This is a time where if you have heard from God here this morning, tell yourself that there is a wisdom to gain. How He has taught you, how He has shown you to gain that heart of wisdom. Pray to Him. Or just simply say, God, help me to be wise. Like young Solomon, he was at the crossroads he ascended the throne and he was so fearful that he would rule the nation wrongly. And God appeared to him, ask what you will from me. And he said, give me a hearing heart. Give me wisdom to discern good and evil. He said, I'm young. I do not know how to go out and how to come in and go out. I need you to guide me to rule this great nation that his father has brought together. And he asked God for that wisdom. And God was pleased with that kind of prayer request. And God said, I will give you what you did not ask as well. I will give you wisdom, I will give you riches, I will give you long life, I will give you even victory over your enemies. Those things that you never asked, I will also give to you. Because once you have wisdom... We can navigate through all kinds of life. We can find ways to make money. We can find ways to achieve victory. We can find ways to keep our health that we may live a long life. We have to get all the wisdom from God, but let it come from God. Lord, I pray for all of us these days that we be wise. And for those who are wise, oh God, help us to be wiser. Let us not at this time stop learning. Stop even wanting to acquire a heart of wisdom. We may have some heart of wisdom. Grant us grace that we may increase in learning. We may increase in wisdom. I commit each one of us into your hands, Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to stay here for a while. Those of you who want prayer, come to the front. Right? As we can, uh, if you have a need, Come quickly so that we all can, I can pray for you if you have a need. In a short while, we'll be dismissed, but come if you still want us to pray for you. God bless you.